an interesting tweet came into the programme last night and I retweeted it and then forgot to mention it. Like the klutz that I am, like the schmuck, like the shamil that I am. Jane Senior, MBE, was on the programme on Tuesday. What a woman Jane is. Largely responsible for blowing the whistle on the incompetence and the lack of interest the police in Yorkshire showed towards the evidence of Muslim grooming gangs. Rotherham, amazing woman, blew the whistle, took a serious risk by sharing uh, classified information. I say classified, sensitive information, but the information was, uh, it was not to be released. It was, in fact, a, a criminal act, her sharing the information she did with the Times newspaper. Great lady spoke to her about that on uh, Tuesday. But one of our listeners was listening to the conversation and was moved by Jane and the work that Jane does with Swinton Lock. Now, Jane works at Swinton Lock, which is a community-based charity to help meet the educational and social needs of people with disabilities and who are at social and economic disadvantages. Okay, it's a wonderful thing. And one of our listeners was listening the other night, she doesn't want to be named, contacted Jane and said, I'm donating the whole contents, all the contents of my shop to help Swinton Lock raise funds. So one of our listeners has got a business and basically said to Jane, I'm going to give you all the contents of my shop to help raise funds for Jane's very worthwhile organisation. That's just a lovely thing, eh? It's nice when you hear things like that. You know, it's um, it's nice to know, even in ways like that, that your, your programme can make some tiny difference. So just by bringing Jane on, that motivated somebody to do something like that. So I'm really proud of that listener who wants to remain anonymous. Fair enough. And uh, well done. I'm sure she's listening. Uh, means a lot to me and it does mean a lot to our listeners as well. Marvellous generosity. Well done you. Thank you. Right. Let's um, let's have a look then at some of the big stories. Do you know what we'll do before we get into the not so much heavy stuff tonight but the heavier stuff. Uh, there was a couple of funny stories in the news today. The sort of things I would have covered in my days as a breakfast radio presenter. God be with the days. <clears throat> Excuse me, did you see this story today? An airplane full of tourists was forced to divert after passengers complained about somebody with foul-smelling body odour. Apparently some man was on a plane and he was so smelly, God love the man, that people around him actually fainted. Right? It was a Transavia Boeing 737. It took off from Sheephall Airport in the Netherlands, headed for Gran Canaria, but instead it touched down in Faro, Faro in Portugal. It didn't carry on to its destination. At one point, the flight crew tried to get the guy into the toilet and get him to stay there for the duration of the flight. But the pilots, in the end, decided to divert the flight. Have you ever heard anything like this in all your life? Passengers became increasingly distressed by the stench. As I said, vomiting and fainting ensued and the poor man was taken off at Faro in the Algarve. Mad stuff. Belgian passenger Piet van Hout was on board and he said the stench of the man was unbearable. It was like he hadn't washed himself for several weeks. Several passengers got sick and had to puke, said Piet van Hout, the Belgian passenger. Transavia confirmed the story, saying it was due to medical reasons. Maybe the man had a medical condition that caused him to give off the very unpleasant odour. Wow. There's a great punchline at the end of this story. It's in today's Daily Mail. And the punchline is, it's not the first time something happened on a Transavia flight this year, something similar. Wait for it. Apparently, a Transavia plane flying from Dubai to Amsterdam was forced to make an emergency landing in Vienna after a passenger couldn't stop farting, which caused a brawl between several passengers. How does that happen? <laughs> How does that happen? At 30,000 feet, 
Somebody is breaking wind and it ends up causing a brawl between passengers that results in the pilot deciding to land the plane. Thank Christ there was no air marshal on board because you could have had the lunacy of somebody being shot to death on board a 737 because they were farting. Wow. But I can beat that because there's a story from back in 2011 which I covered when I was in Spain. The uh, rather rotund French actor Gerard Depardieu caused a plane which was going to Dublin to return back to the gate after he decided to just stand up and piss all over the aisle (laughs) because he was refused entry to the toilets. You know, they're going through the thing, waving their hands. Follow these instructions in case we need to make an emergency. Depardieu said, I want to go to the toilet. They said, no, sit down till we're in the air. So he stood up and pissed all over the floor. (laughs) Ah, The world is a mad place, isn't it? Imagine being on that plane. We're not the most patient travellers these days. Imagine being on the plane today when a guy's got to be taken off because he's rather smelly. Gerard Depardieu. Whenever I think of Gerard Depardieu, I can't help but thinking of the English comedian Joe Pasquale, who came up with this fantastic little ditty. Gentlemen, you know, I was very disappointed to find out that Michael Bublé's not on the show. I was told Michael Bublé might be on, but they lied. He's not here. At all. Apparently he's at a wedding, big showbiz wedding in America. Apparently Whoopi Goldberg is now going to marry the French actor Gerard Depardieu, and now she's going to be called Whoopi Doopy Doo. <laughs> <laughs> boom, boom. Right, 12 minutes past the hour, enough of the messing. Enough of the messing, as we would say, in Ireland. Let's get to the serious stuff. The President of Syria, Bashar al-Assad, has given an in-depth interview to Russia Today, which was broadcast in its entirety earlier. In fact, if you want to watch it later on, the entire interview can be found at RT.com or RT's YouTube channel. Now, it's the first in-depth interview that Assad has given for quite a while, because there's been a lot going on. The only in-depth interviews he has given in the last year or so have been to RT. I think it's about two years now since he sat down with the BBC for a proper interview. So RT went to see him. He was first asked a good question. How close does he think we are to the end of hostilities? The end of the so-called war in Syria, this is what the Syrian president had to say. Uh, with every uh, move forward in the battlefield, with every victory, with every liber- liberated area, we are moving closer, closer to the end of the conflict. And I always say it, uh, without external interference, it won't take more than a year to settle the situation in, in, in Syria. But at the same time, with every move forward for the Syrian army, and for the political process, and for the whole situation forward in the positive meaning towards the most stability. Uh, Our uh, enemies and our uh, opponents, uh, mainly the West, led by the United States and their puppets in uh, Europe and in our region, with their mercenaries in Syria, they try to make it further, uh, either by supporting more terrorism, uh, bringing more terrorists coming to Syria, or by uh, hindering the political uh, process. So our challenge is how can we make this gap, to close this gap between their plans and our plans. And I think we are succeeding in that regard. But at the same time, uh, it's difficult for anyone to tell you uh, when. But it is getting closer. That's self-evident. So the Americans and their puppets in Europe and the Israelis continue to support jihadists no matter how difficult it's getting now for them to achieve their aims because the Syrian government, of course, has achieved success in Aleppo, in Homs, in Damascus and the surrounding areas. Nearly there, said Assad, but the Americans and their puppets continue to um, flog a dead horse by sending in more jihadists and more arms. So Assad was then reminded that tens of thousands of jihadists who have fled Damascus and Aleppo and Homs surrounding areas, they're now building defences in Idlib. Could the president accept that Idlib might be out of government control 
for a time. This is what he said. Uh, actually, we always say we're going to liberate every area. So it's impossible for us to, to intentionally leave any area on the Syrian soil outside our control as government. This is uh, natural. Uh, and as you know, Idlib was captured by the uh, uh, terrorists in 2015 with this uh, Turkish support. Uh, it, was, it was mainly captured by al-Nusra and some other supportive factions. We started the, the reconciliations before that time, but every reconciliation happened after that time, after 2015, uh, it was I think May 2015, every faction wanted to leave the city or the village, they choose to go to Idlib. Uh, this is a very good indication that they have the same ideology, because they choose to go to Al Nusra area, they didn't choose to go to any other area. So we didn't send people to Idlib, they wanted to go to Idlib because they have the same uh, incubator, they have the same atmosphere, way of thinking, and so on. Uh, this one uh, part, the other part, which is military aspect of, the, of, of your question, the plan of the terrorists and their masters was to uh, distract the Syrian army by uh, scattering the different units all over the Syrian uh, soil, which is not good for any army. Our plan was to put them in one area, two areas, three areas. If, if, let's say if you have two or three or four frontiers, better than having tens and maybe more than 100 frontiers at the same time. So militarily, it is better. They chose it, but it's better for us from the military point of view. Nice diplomatic way of put it, putting things there from the Syrian president. Nice diplomatic way of saying, let them all gather in Idlib or around Idlib. We will blow the piss out of them there. Let them all congregate in one place rather than open up frontiers elsewhere, which makes it more difficult. Okay, fair enough. So what about the US military presence in the country? It's one thing to be driving back these Wahhabists, these jihadists, al-Nusra, al-Qaeda, ISIS, whatever name they're giving them today, SDF or SDP, whatever they're calling them. What about the US military presence in the country? Well, he didn't pull any punches. We don't have any other option. So this is our land, it's our right, and it's our duty to liberate it. And the American should leave somehow. They're going to leave. They came to Iraq with no legal basis. And look what happened to them. They have to learn the lesson. Iraq is no exception, and Syria is no exception. People will not accept foreigners in this region anymore. Fantastic stuff, really. He said, by hook or by crook, one way or another, the United States will leave our country. Good for him. What about Israel and the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's threats that Syria could be destroyed by Israel? I think Netanyahu used the term liquidated. What did the president have to say about Israel? Uh, since we were born, I'm talking about my generation, and most of the generations are now in, in Syria, uh, we lived under the threat of the Israeli aggression. This is something uh, in, in our unconscious feeling. Uh, so to say that you're afraid uh, while living with the same threat for decades, this is nonsense. Uh, Israeli has been assassinating, killing, occupying, for decades now, for more than uh, around seven decades in, in this uh, region. But usually they do all this without threatening. Now, why do they threat why? in this way? This is panic. This is kind of hysterical uh, feeling because they are le losing the dear ones, the dear ones, al Nusra and ISIS. That's why Israel now is panicking recently, and we understand their, their feeling. Well, Israel, Israel is now seemingly striking across Syria, airstrikes at will. They're boasting publicly on camera again and again that your defenses, they're powerless to stop them, that they can do in Syria whatever they want. Uh, is that true? Is there anything you can do to stop Israel carrying out its airstrikes in Syria? Yeah. Actually, the first target of the mercenaries in Syria was the air defense. 
before attacking any other military base. It was the air defense. And you would be surprised at that time, why do they attack the air defense? The air defense will not deal with the peaceful demonstrators, as they say, or with the moderate forces, and it cannot deal with extremists anyway. It's another thing, it's to defend the country. This is the other proof that Israel was in direct link with those terrorists in, in, in Syria. So they attacked those bases and they destroyed big part of our air defenses. Now, in spite of that, our, our position, uh, let's say our uh, air defense is much stronger than before, thanks to the uh, Russian support and the recent attacks by the Israeli and by the uh, American and British and French proved that we are in a better situation. Now the only option, uh, my answer to your question, is to improve our air defense. This is the only thing that we can do. And we are doing that. Good stuff. There's a little bit more to that, but you heard the more salient points of that interview. If you want to see all of it, it's available at rt.com. It's their interview, their property. And you can see it on their YouTube channel as well. Go to youtube.com. Just look for RT. Good stuff. I suppose those behind that entity, behind the chaos in Syria, is probably wondering what the hell is going on. Expected, of course, probably four, five years ago for this to be over and for a puppet government to be in place in Damascus. Or, even more likely, just widespread lunacy, chaos, Mad Max, the sort of situation that we see in Libya today, which we've talked about a lot on this programme. James tweets, thanks James. No politician can claim to have clean hands, but I'm continually impressed with Assad's frankness. No wonder the US hates him, says James. David tweets, it's about time someone told it like it is. On the world stage, go Bashar, says uh, David there. Cheers for that. 22 and a half minutes past the air. Very quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk uh, a little bit about, is it not Belgium? Denmark has banned... What is Denmark banned again, Richie? The veil, the full face veil. Uh, that ban will come into force on the 1st of August, but the law was passed in, da in Danish Parliament today. We'll have a little chat about that when I come back, and I'm very keen on your opinion on that. Denmark has passed a ban on full face veils. What do you think? We will talk about US steel, Donald Trump imposing tariffs on steel coming in from Mexico, from the EU, amongst other places. We'll talk about that and much more this hour. This is your Richie Allen Show, Thursday, May 31st, 2018. Have you lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone, or other storage device? Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information, or a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like the pictures, movies, and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS, and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. There's a place high in the mountains of Spain, a sanctuary where souls gather from all around the globe to learn about themselves and experience powerful changes in the way we see our world. They become awakened to their gifts and their power to heal others. Become part of this ever-growing worldwide family of unique, pure energy healing practitioners. Discover how amazing you truly are. Go to www www.markbayerski.com It could just change your life forever. Introducing the H2O app, a powerful water structure and application that programs vibrational energies into water through the use of different sound frequencies. Once programmed, the use of water for drinking, cooking, bathing. Give it to your friends and colleagues or spread it around the garden. The list goes on. It's not just water that the app can be used for either. It's great for programming crystals too. The H2O app is free to download and is available on both Android and Apple platforms. For further information, go to h2oapp.online. The Richie Allen Show relies on your support. Go to richieallen.co.uk and set up a monthly donation today. Welcome back to the most listened to independent radio show in Europe. It's your Richie Allen Show. 
Yes, welcome back indeed. Thursday's programme live on Fab Radio 2, triggerwarning.tv, richieallen.co.uk. Thank you, Les, for tweeting a link to the Assad interview. I'm sure people could have found it, Les, but thank you very much. Uh, to um, Twitter again, just very briefly, uh, Moinga tweeted, Assad sounds very sure and precise in his own practical approach. And Base Ninja tweets, My late father worked in Damascus and Aleppo, he told me the Syrians were the nicest people he met in the Middle East and Aleppo was a true jewel. Look at Aleppo now. Bastards, says Base Ninja. Yeah. Yeah. There was a BBC report from Damascus. Not from Damascus. Was it from Damascus? It was from Damascus the other day. From, from southern Damascus, I think. And it looks like a scene you'd see from a Hollywood film. It looks like there are years and years of reparation, rebuilding uh, to be done there. It's pretty dreadful. And of course, the bastards behind it, obviously envisaged, envisaged even, as they did with Iraq, giving no bid contracts to their buddies, their globalist buddies, Halliburton and companies like this. Yes, we've just gone and wrecked the fucking place. You can have no bid contracts. We'll give you billions now to go in and build it up again under the puppet government that we've installed. But it ain't working out for them at the moment and it doesn't look like it's going to work out for them at least in the way they wanted it to they might they, they might have cards up their sleeves yet still in terms of invading the country don't rule it out please god no but don't rule it out now Denmark has passed a ban on full face veils it's the latest in a number of countries in the EU to pass such a ban it affects Muslim women mostly wearing a niqab or Borka. It passed by 75 votes to 30 in Parliament today. As I said earlier, it comes into force on the 1st of August. If you're found in violating the ban, you will be expected to pay a fine of a thousand kroner, which is about £120, thereabouts, £118. But if you repeat uh, the offence having been fined once, you might be fined over a thousand pounds. The wording of the new legislation does not specifically mention Muslim women, but says that anyone who wears a garment that hides the face in public will be punished with a fine. Denmark's Justice Minister Soren Pape Paulsen said, in terms of value, I see a discussion of what kind of society we should have with the roots and culture we have is that we don't cover our face and eyes. We must be able to see each other and we must be able to see each other's facial expressions. It is a value in Denmark. I'm sure the alt-right are loving this. They love this. Good luck to them. I'm not saying they're wrong. Amnesty International has said it's a discriminatory violation of women's rights. But the European Court of Human Rights last year upheld Belgium's ban on full-face veils. The ECHR said that communal harmony trumped the individual's right to religious expression. Do you like that? Do you like that idea? That communal harmony trumps your individual right to religious expression. What do you think? What happened to individual freedom? Because there is no freedom if the government can tell you what to wear. Now don't think for a minute that I'm delighted with the niqab or the burqa. I've had my issues with them in Manchester and in London. I find them a little bit sinister. I don't like them. But maybe I can go and fuck off, maybe. And just not look at them, maybe. I don't know. I don't see any compromise here. I'd like to know what you think. What about saying, right, ladies, you've got to take it off in banks, official buildings, supermarkets, I don't know. Give and take, maybe. I don't know. What do you think? I'm no liberal. I'm no progressive. I think you know that. And I'm not thrilled by the niqab. I really am not. Saw a bit of it in Spain as well. What do you think? Let me know. At Richie Allen Show on Twitter. That's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. Trevor says, how you Trevor? Trevor the mule. Trevor the mule. Hope you're not a drugs mule, Trev. Well, maybe I do. Maybe I hope you are a drugs mule. If Denmark wants to ban something, they should ban the slaughter of whales and dolphins in the Faroe Islands. A lot of our listeners 
would agree with that. Tiger Johnson tweets, how you doing, Tiger? Assad is someone I would refer to as a statesman. And Base Ninja tweets, I thought the ban was full face clothes. So no ninjaring around in Denmark for me then. <laughs> yes, people have unkindly, it has been argued, unkindly referred to women who wear the niqab as ninjas. I've heard that expression quite a lot over here. Uh, I don't know, folks. You know, I, I'm not thrilled about it. I'm a religious. I'm an atheist. I think religions are crazy. I've explained a lot about why I believe religions came into being. I don't like them. Uh, but still, if somebody wants to wear something, should the government tell them they can't? What do you think? Let me know at Richie Allen Show. Right, let's move on then. That was in the BBC today, just as I was coming on air. More, it's uh, 29 minutes to the top of the year. Bart Sabrell joins the programme a bit later on. Arkady or Arkady Babchenko, this is the journalist, the Russian journalist who faked his own death in order to evade what he says was a Russian plot to assassinate him. Now today, he said pig's blood and a makeup artist were used to help stage the incident. Ukrainian officials reported on Tuesday that Babchenko had been murdered outside his apartment in Kiev. They posted these horrible pictures of him lying in a pool of blood. The media was very quick to say Russia was behind it. This is disgraceful, but it's what we expect. The broadsheet media and the broadcast media in this country rushed to say, oh, a Russian journalist is dead, the bastard Russians. And then yesterday he turned up at a press conference and he was in fine fettle, so he was, to be sure, to be sure. He was in fine fettle. Wow, what a story. So Babchenko, uh, he's taken a bit of stick over the deception from some journalists who are a bit red-faced, a bit embarrassed because they believed it and rushed to blame the Russians. He said today, I went along with it because I was told my life was in danger. Now, John White is a political commentator and he spoke to RT today and he suggested a plausible motive for this fairly bizarre story. The timing is key, I think. Just uh, before we start the World Cup in Russia, which is a showcase event for any country that holds the World Cup, that hosts the World Cup, and suddenly we're getting these stories which, is desi which are designed, I would speculate, to discredit Russia uh, and discredit Russia in the eyes of the world just as it's about to host the World Cup. And so this is a very lamentable campaign that's been um, targeting Russia because it's now interfering in areas in which all nations have in the past understood that they are off limits when it comes to using them for propaganda purposes, such as trying to use a World Cup to undermine the host nation. That does no good to anyone, especially at a time when we need to try and foment understanding. Yeah, I think he's onto something when he says it might be down to Russia hosting the World Cup, which is only a couple of weeks away. At least the opening ceremony is anyway. You might remember back in the late winter, I feared, and feared was the right word, I thought that at the last, at the 11th hour, that FIFA would take the World Cup away from Russia. I thought that was on the table. Of course, I was wrong because I'm mostly wrong when it comes to my predictions. I'm no Nostradamus. But I thought that was a real possibility and if that didn't happen, I thought that some countries might pull out of it and have their own summer tournament in the UK because the UK's got the best stadia in the world and all ready to go. Honky dory, but it hasn't come to pass. But watch the World Cup closely. Watch it for possible false flag attacks. Keep an eye on the World Cup for false flag I don't mean necessarily big terrorist incidents but I wouldn't rule them out but also while it's on and while Russia is on full display to the world it's lovely cities, it's beautiful architecture it's lovely stadia don't be surprised if something happens that Russia is blamed for that's all I'm saying so keep an eye on that uh, a few more comments coming in about the burqa, the niqab um, David tweets, David Stanford, I don't see why religion should allow you to do things everyone else can't, but are they also going to ban the mercenaries who pose as cops during false flags wearing their full face balaclava? Good stuff, David. I, I was at Manchester Airport again last Saturday to pick up uh, my partner 
uh, Caroline, the oft mentioned. And I got there. I've learned to time my visits to the airport because I'm only a 15 minute drive away. So I've learned to time them so I'm not waiting around forever. So I waited until I was watching the radar thing on the flight uh, app, on the app. Not on the app, but on, 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 on my laptop. And I saw the plane was coming in to land. So I set off then, so I didn't have to wait there too long. But yeah, Manchester Airport is full of these stormtroopers, head to toe in Kevlar, body armour, faces covered, walking around like fucking retards in a so-called free and open and fair society. These fools that look like Robocops walking around. See, David, what you started? You see what you started, David? Anyway... Anyway, Moinga tweeted, to counter what David said, I think the women would take them off respectfully when in public spaces like banks where you will interact with strangers. So that might be, that might have been a compromise. Rather than say you can't wear the niqab anymore, um, why not say, look, when you're in buildings, you can't wear it. How about that? Right? Right. Cartoon Drunk says, what about a bloke wearing a Borat mankini? Would that go down well in Saudi Arabia or would you end up in a chop shop square off with your head? Richard Angelis tweets, I agree, only banning all face coverings in banks, jewellers and on all government-owned buildings, universities, other places must be free to decide for themselves, says Richard. James tweets, a lot of interest in this. The burqa inhibits the efficacy of facial recognition and other CCTV tech. Maybe that's part of the reason behind the ban. Conspiracy alert. Laugh out loud, says James. Good stuff, James. 23 minutes to the top of the hour. Big story, this. It's been co- I, didn't, I didn't lead with this because, for me, the big story today is the interview with Assad, the Syrian president, and the remarks made by Bashar al-Assad in that interview. But this is a big story. The United States has said... It will impose tariffs on steel and aluminium imports from allies in Europe and North America. The US set a 25% tax on steel and a 10% tax on aluminium from the EU, Mexico and Canada will begin at midnight tonight, presumably midnight Eastern time. DC is on Eastern time, presumably. The move triggered vows of retaliation from Mexico and the EU, which called the tariff protectionism pure and simple. The UK said it was deeply disappointed. EU Trade Commissioner Cecilia Malmström said it was a bad day for world trade, while European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker said the move was totally unacceptable and we can hear a little of what Jean-Claude the Drunker said a little earlier today. This is a bad day for the world trade. The European Union cannot react to that with without any kind of reaction. So we'll immediately introduce a settlement dispute uh, on, the le- on, on the WTO uh, level and we'll announce in the next coming hours counterbalancing uh, measures. What they can do, we are able to do exactly uh, the same. It's totally unacceptable that a country is imposing unilateral measures when it comes to world uh, trade. Yeah, Jean-Claude Drunker. Oh, they're pissed off in the EU. Well cheesed off. Sky News spoke with the communications manager of Eurofair. That's a guy called Charles the... Charles, Charles, Charles de Lusignan. Charles de Lusignan, the communications manager of Eurofair, and he's not happy at all. Well, good afternoon. Well, uh, very serious indeed. We export about €5 billion Euros worth of steel to the US every year. And if that's all, hit, if that's hit by 25% tariffs, that's going to create that's going to create a, a quite significant loss of market share for EU producers who have long been reliable partners in the US. So this is a, an absolutely dismal day, not only for EU steel producers but also for the world trade system in general. And could you elaborate more on this impact? What damage could there be? Could we see a loss of jobs? Well, at the extreme, our calculations when the measures were first proposed was that, in fact, on both sides of the Atlantic, there could be a loss, a job losses of up to 140,000 jobs. Hold on there just a minute, Charles de Lusignan. Imagine the balls, imagine the cojones of a European Union puppet 
talking about this resulting in job losses when the European Union, through making it illegal for countries to protect their own steel industries, has itself cost millions of jobs. Millions, millions, millions of jobs. What a puppet. How dare he? How dare Annie, Brussels bureaucrat, wanker, unelected official, talk about the possibility that jobs are going to be lost over this when that institution has destroyed the steel industry in the United Kingdom and right across Europe? Hey, Unbelievable. He goes on. Directly and indirectly by sectors affected or linked to the steel sector. So the, the effect could be very, very large indeed if the measures stick, which of course we hope they don't. And indeed the EU's response has been very firm, very vigorous. We welcome this. And the only way that these, ta these damaging tariffs are going to ever be dismantled is if the EU stands firm in responding to the US by saying, no, this doesn't go, this doesn't fly. You can't do this in the context of a free multilateral trading system. What difference will that make if Europe takes that stance? Can it, can it protect itself? The irony. Referring to Europe as one country is what she's doing there. A super state. Can Europe protect itself? When, as I said, and I have to labour this point, steel companies right across the European Union in countries have been destroyed because of their rules and regulations on the importation of steel and their ridiculous so-called pro-competition laws that, in th that mean that when companies want to um, take on full large-scale building projects in the UK, they can't just buy UK steel. They have to put the bid out to tender, out to the European Union. Right? What does he say? Elf. Well, I think Europe has evidence that it can protect itself and bear in mind that it is the world's largest and richest open market that does take in a lot of US imports as well as exporting to the US. So no, the EU has a unique position here and it can take the lead in, in being a guardian for world trade and, and supporting the multilateral system that the US ultimately helped build in the first place. You know, Donald Trump uh, will likely only be there for a couple of years, whereas the world trading system has been there since the end of the war. So it's important that it is maintained. And I think Europe, if it stands united and, and, and makes a commitment to, to solid messaging on this and, re and acting accordingly, uh, I think they could actually come out of this better than worse. If you were running a country, why would you allow tens of thousands of your citizens lose their jobs? Because companies were buying cheap steel either from Europe or from China. Why would you allow that? Why? Your duty, your job, your, your responsibility is to the people of your country. Is to protect your industries. These bastards have made protectionism a bad word, a dirty word. It's insane that you would import steel. It's the easiest thing in the world to manufacture. No country in the world should import it. You should have thousands of people in work doing it. Now, I don't know whether to believe Trump or not. Trump is a Rothschild Zionist puppet. I have no idea what's going on there. I wish it was true. Not just in America, but here as well. It's one of the great things about leaving the European Union, not that it's ever going to happen. No, 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 no. We will subsidise certain industries. Because that's what government should do. Yes, steel is... It, there isn't anything more important to a country, to keep a country going, than steel. So as a government, will subsidise these... will partly nationalise these companies. Public-private partnerships, keep people in work, will subsidise where necessary. And we will run our country. And we will build our country using steel manufactured in this country. All the EU has done is wreck industry, whether it's fishing, whether it's steel, whether it's car manufacturing, destroyed it. And now these bastards are crying because the Americans have said, well, no, we're going to protect our steel and aluminium. How serious Trump is about that, I have no idea. But anyway, crazy. Les tweets, if the UK did the same as the US, then maybe we could make our own steel 
and create thousands of jobs. Yes, Les, but not create thousands, save thousands of jobs and re-employ people who've lost their jobs. We spoke a lot two years ago about Redcar and what was going on there and Brussels interference in that situation that made it impossible for the UK government to bail people out, help people. Right, OK. We're going to build 500,000 new houses for people who can't afford to rent. Social housing. 500,000 we're going to build. Or a million. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to make that steal in this country. And we're not going to borrow from the, from, from, from the Bank of England to pay for that. Because by doing that, we're really borrowing from the Rothschild-controlled European Central Bank. We're going to make the money. We'll issue the currency. Put people back to work. Put hundreds of thousands of people back to work. Just like that. People have said to me before, when I've ranted like this, you're full of shit, Richie, you know nothing about it. I know everything about it. I know everything about it. Been studying it for years, economics. If you issue your own debt-free currency, marvellous. I tell you what, lads, we're going to build a million houses for people. Nice houses. Three-bedroom houses for people. Semi-detached, where we can. And we're going to get British labourers, men and women, to do it. And we're going to... The materials are going to be made by British companies. Think about it. It's one I'm very passionate about, as you might have gathered. Madness. 12 minutes, 13 minutes to the top of the air. Where am I? Have I any time to do this next story? I want to do this next story. Germaine Greer is an author and feminist, and I've always taken an interest in what Germaine has had to say. I find her engaging and thought-provoking, even if, of course, there are things that would leave me a little bit behind or leave me cold. What's wrong with that? You know what I think about identity politics I don't like isms, I don't like uh, ologies, I don't like feminism, I don't like anything that has to do with identity politics. Feminism belongs in that category, but it doesn't matter. I like um, smart people, and Jermaine Greer is a smart woman, whether she's right or whether she's wrong. She's getting it in the neck today, though, because she was addressing the, um, the Hay Festival. It's a literary festival, and she was um, talking about rape. And she said that rape shouldn't be viewed as a spectacularly violent crime, but more as a lazy, careless and insensitive act. She suggested 200 hours community service and perhaps an or tattoo on the rapist's hand, arm or cheek was an appropriate comment. Maybe she was joking when she said that. Now, she was violently raped when she was 18 years old. And she said in cases of violent rape, the courts should concentrate on the violence, attracting higher sentences rather than having lengthy trials in which women are humiliated for long periods. And at this Hay Literary Festival, she said rape was widespread and the legal system could not cope because it always comes down to consent, with the victims becoming bits of evidence. She said, I want to turn the discourse about rape upside down. We are not getting anywhere approaching it down the tunnel of history. Most rapes don't involve any injury whatsoever. Most rape is just lazy, just careless, insensitive every time a man rolls over on his exhausted wife and insists on enjoying his conjugal rights, he is raping her. It will never end up in a court of law. Instead of thinking of rape as a spectacularly violent crime, and some rapes are, think of it as non-consensual, it is bad sex, sex where there is no communication, no tenderness, no mention of love. She also went on to say, Germaine Greer, something which she has said a lot about the Me Too movement. She said she's tired of women being portrayed as victims and women seeking victimhood. Controversial comments, these. Here's Sky News on it today. Now, the author, Germaine Greer, has caused controversy with her calls for rape sentences to be drastically cut. Speaking at the Hay Festival, she said the current system of prosecuting rape is not working. She suggested most rapists could be ordered to do community service with harsher sentences for obvious violence, although she argued that the majority of cases are non-violent. Instead of thinking of rape as a spectacularly violent crime, and some rapes are, think about it as consensual, non-consensual, that is, bad sex. Most rape 
is just lazy, just careless, just insensitive, every time. Yeah, that was Sky News' rough cut. They rough cut it there. It's a controversial comments indeed, and I'm sure, I'm pretty sure there are people listening to this programme who are sexually assaulted, and they might be wound up by those comments. Fair enough. So they invited an anti-harassment campaigner on. What does that mean? Anti-harassment campaigner. Uh, the woman's name is Kelsey Mohammed. Here's Kelsey Mohammed responding to what Jermaine Greer said today. Uh, I mean, that interview itself was very hard to watch, to be honest. I found it uh, very upsetting. And I do want to acknowledge a lot of the survivors out there who may have found that interview very upsetting because I find that she definitely diminished and minimized the experiences of survivors. I think the... Uh, the analysis that she has, which is partly correct in terms of the criminal justice system not being set up to support survivors and that the uh, it, it's not currently working to imprison perpetrators and that is not ending rape. But the way that she has now minimized rape as if it's not serious, uh, I think speaks to her completely misunderstanding the problem. And really, it's uh, yeah, it's just not been. It's not been what we want in terms of the narrative around sexual violence, because what we really want to look at is the ways that we can support survivors as a community, because we see that the criminal justice system is not doing that. But did she minimise rape, Germaine Greer, in what she said? Or was it that she didn't choose her words very carefully? Was Greer trying to say that rape is a terrible thing? Where somebody rapes somebody violently, they should be in prison. But when somebody maybe could have not consented, maybe could have, I don't know what to say here. This is a strange one. I kind of understand what Greer was trying to get at, but I can't articulate it any better than she was trying to. And she's, I think she's more articulate than me, pretty sure she is. What was she trying to say there? Maybe she was saying that some women, I think she was trying to say that some women have complained after the fact when maybe they might have been able to extricate themselves from it, from that situation. Maybe it was non-consensual sex in a relationship. Non-violent. The guy didn't force himself on her. She didn't want it. Maybe said she didn't want it. Maybe she was badgered into it, went along with it anyway. Is that what she was talking about? I don't know because somebody grabbing somebody and forcing themselves on them, penetrating them, they should be fucking banged up forever as far as I'm concerned. Um, but what was she trying to get at? Do you have any idea what she was trying to get at? I think it's kind of profound, but I think she was struggling to articulate it. Bearing in mind that this is the same woman who spoke out against the Me Too movement, saying she's tired of women claiming victimhood because they were asked out for a date or because their arse was pinched in a... You know, and, that, and that's wrong as well. I've never pinched anybody's arse that I worked with, male or female. Um, but she was saying, why don't you turn around and, you know, basically punch him in the fucking mouth and say, don't do it again. Don't be a victim. Um, she's trying to differentiate between relationships where there has been some sort of non-consensual sex and what could be or should be done about that. And that's where she was talking about laziness. Um, but I don't think this anti-harassment campaigner, Kelsey Muhammad, really knows her arse from her elbow, as she demonstrates here. I think these comments are hugely unhelpful in terms of, uh, because we want to expand the, what we have done in our work is expanded the definition of violence to understand that coercion, control, manipulation, all of these things still affect uh, survivors in terms of having long-term effects of trauma. Um, and when we want to look at actually uprooting the culture that normalizes sexual violence, we ne need to look at that whole spectrum. We need to look at how we can support survivors, how the services that we need to provide. And we need to look at a holistic approach to education in order to prevent. That's got nothing to do with what Jermaine Greer was saying, though. Normalizing sexual violence. Well, that's pornography which is widely available. We talked about this yesterday or the day before. I can't remember. So try and stop youngsters from seeing this violent pornography. Yes, of course. But as for caring for people who've been raped, that's got nothing to do with the Justice Department or, 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 or law and order. It's up to law and order to bring cases against people where they can prove that somebody has been raped or sexually assaulted. After they have either found somebody guilty through a proper judicial process 
or not. It's up to the health authorities and the health providers to provide care and trauma counselling for women and men who have been sexually assaulted. I don't think it's got anything to do with what Greer was saying. I've invited Jermaine Greer on the programme before and I've never heard back from her. I'd like to have her on to ask her, what do you mean by that? To talk about this Me Too movement and to talk about these comments that she made on rape. I think it's a very interesting area to explore. I really do. It's come up a few times on the programme lately and I want to get into it in depth in the very near future. It is exactly four and a half minutes to the top of the year. Bart Sabrell joins me in less than five minutes' time. It's been nearly three years since we've chatted. Uh, I love Bart, love listening to him and uh, can't wait to chat with him again. He'll be with me in a couple of minutes' time. In the meantime, I'm going to take a very quick break. It's your Richie Allen Show for Thursday the 31st of May 2018. Have you lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone, or other storage device? Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information, or a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like the pictures, movies, and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS, and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. There's a place high in the mountains of Spain, a sanctuary where souls gather from all around the globe to learn about themselves and experience powerful changes in the way we see our world. They become awakened to their gifts and their power to heal others. Become part of this ever-growing worldwide family of unique, pure energy healing practitioners. Discover how amazing you truly are. Go to www. Markbayerski.com. It could just change your life forever. Introducing the H2O app, a powerful water structure and application that programs vibrational energies into water through the use of different sound frequencies. Once programmed, the use of water for drinking, cooking, bathing. Give it to your friends and colleagues or spread it around the garden. The list goes on. It's not just water that the app can be used for either. It's great for programming crystals too. The H2O app is free to download and is available on both Android and Apple platforms. For further information, go to h2oapp.online. Welcome back to the most listened to independent radio show in Europe. It's your Richie Allen Show. Welcome back indeed. Just a couple of comments that I want to get through before we introduce Bart. Some interesting comments there. Uh, James, thanks for the comment. He says, I think, and, and I poorly said this, I said this very poorly in fact, ironically, I poorly said this, I said this poorly myself. Uh, James, you're bang on I think. I think what she's driving at is the idea that if a husband asks his wife for sex 50 times in an hour and she eventually says yes, gives in, that's not the same as rape perhaps. Beyond that, I'm out. Articulation of this issue is a nightmare. That's good. Uh, I find that as well. Now, Susan says, I've never viewed Jermaine Greer as intelligent. She's like some weirdly programmed helpmate of destruction of female identity and nothing that falls from her mouth. Mouth even has ever benefited women ever. Susan, fair enough. You're entitled to that opinion, of course. I disagree with you. I've been listening to her and watching her and reading her for a long time, more than 20 years, and there would be things that she would say that I would laugh out loud at. But other times I find it very sharp and very on point. But I uh, take your point. Thanks for the tweet there. Liz says, should a woman be asked more than once if she says no? Liz, I would say no. Now, have I asked my partner for sex before and she said no? Yes. Have I asked her again? Probably yes. What was the result of that? Um, I live with a very strong woman and I was told basically to fuck off. Basically, to go to a dark room by myself and sort myself out. That's the truth. Um, me asking for a second time would have been kind of, oh, come on. But that would have been the end of it, is the truth of it. You know, I'm not a perfect guy, but I wouldn't be, you know, insisting. You know, if you lived with somebody as long as I've lived with my partner, 16 years, that's a lot these days. But I'm sure there are people listening to this programme who have been married for 25, 30, 40 years. When have you been married, when have you been together 16 years? There have been times when one or the other in a couple wants relations. Relations. And the other person doesn't. 
And um, if you're aroused and the other person doesn't, it's frustrating. Right? Right, I would have said yes. Um, but yeah, you shouldn't insist. Of course you should not insist. When the other person says no, you should say fair enough and go to a dark room with a nudie magazine or something else. Sort yourself out and then just get on with things. That's what I would say. 